So just everybody at once, shout out your favorite beverage. On the count of three. One, two, three. You're all wrong. You're all wrong. Best beverage in the entire world is a blue Powerade, but half frozen, so it's kind of like a slushy. Drink it all day, every day, you disagree, but you're wrong. You're wrong. So who's in the movie Inception? Anyone see yeah. the movie Inception? It's a little bit more of a movie, but we see the movie Inception. Yeah. Cool. So the whole point of the movie Inception is it's the idea of a dream inside of a dream, and it ends up being inside of a dream, right? So three levels deep. Well, I have for you for the first time ever in the history of the world, maybe not, but it's a we're doing a series Inception. So if you know, we've been in a series called Jesus, because there is no better name than just to call it Jesus. And we've been asking two questions. Who is Jesus and why should you care? And we've come to a spot kind of in this story as we're going through the book of John. And I really saw that there's a story in the Bible we're going to look at today and actually next week too. And it really prompted me to have a little series within our series. So for the next two weeks, we're going to be talking about a series that I'm calling Encountering Jesus. Encounter Jesus. And really what we're doing. I don't even know what it means when cross falls on the front of the We're going to just sit right back up. That was wild. Okay, maybe I'm not the first one to ever do a series inception. I take that back. I'm sorry for lying. All right. Wow. Okay, so there's that drum fail video. You guys know the drum cage that they put around the drums? They keep them not as loud. So there's so many videos of this shield just falling on top of the drummer. And there's a video where there's a cross on the stage. The cross falls into the drum shield, and the drum shield falls into the drummer. And the drummer somehow keeps playing while like throwing it off. Pretty amazing. <laughs> wow. All right. So we're talking about encountering Jesus. Now, in the next two weeks, we're going to be kind of basing it off one idea, and that is the fact that one encounter with Jesus can change your life forever. Some of you, that sounds familiar. If you remember a month or so ago, we spent a week just casting vision for this ministry and where I felt God was calling us for this year. And this was the idea that one encounter with Jesus can change your life forever. Though it's fun to gather here and play fun games and to sing music and to drink way too much soda, we gather here because a guy named Jesus has changed so many of our lives. That's why I'm here. That's why Josh is here. That's why your leaders are here. That's why churches are here. And I really believe that if people can encounter Jesus, their lives will be changed for the better for the rest of their lives and for all eternity. This next week, we're going to look at a story. Next two weeks, and it's in John chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to John chapter 4. We're going to kind of be all over this story, but the first passage is going to be John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. If you have a Bible, open it up. If you have a phone app, you can open it up. And if not, we're going to have it up on the screen here. And this story, it's a famous story, and it really, um, it really encapsulates what we're going to be talking about. This woman, she meets Jesus, and her life changes forever. So we're going to spend two weeks on it. If you have your Bibles, open up to John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. I'm going to read it for us. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that's saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So turn to your neighbor and tell them the title of this message tonight. And it is, Oh, you thirsty. Oh, you thirsty. You guys say it's Matthew. Say it's Matthew, please. Please, turn to your neighbor and tell him. Oh, you thirsty. Oh, you thirsty. Oh, you thirsty. Oh, you thirsty. And, no, it's actually Thursday, so it's like there's like an A and an E Thursday. So, the big idea for tonight, the big idea for tonight, I want you guys to get this. This is exactly where we're going. This is where we're headed. It's where we're going to stay the whole night. Is this only Jesus can satisfy your thirst? Only Jesus can satisfy your thirst. So, what's going on in this passage? We have a Samaritan woman, she's at a well. We have Jesus, she's confused why Jesus is talking to her. Well, see, Jesus, he had been doing a bunch of miracles, he'd been doing these signs. We've talked about a few of them, and the Jewish religious leaders were getting upset with Jesus, they were trying to kill Jesus, and it wasn't his time yet. So, he decided he had to get out of Judea and he had to travel back to his hometown. 
And Jews didn't like Samaritans. Samaritans were uh, half Jew, half Assyrian. The Jewish people, the Assyrians, they intermingled, they got married, they had kids. And the Jews did not like the Samaritans because they were a different race. Yes, racism has been around since the beginning of time. It is nothing new. So Jesus typically would never go through Samaria. A Jew would never go through Samaria. They hated them so much, they would take the long way all the way around Samaria. But we see Jesus do something different. He decides to go straight through it. Which brings me to my first point for tonight. That is that Jesus never avoids someone who needs him. Jesus never avoids someone who needs him. And I think that in itself proves that he's God. I say, really? He like rose from the dead, but this is what proves he's God? Yes, because I guarantee all of you have someone in your life you do not want to be around. And we just be real with each other, right? Like you see them in the hallways at school and you decide to go the other way, right? Yeah. Or some of you, you see them hop on the Zoom and you're like, I'm leaving the Zoom call. Whatever situation with school. But if you're asking yourself, there's someone in your life right now that you just pray to God. The only time you pray is when you see this person. You don't want to talk to them, right? But Jesus never avoids someone who needs him. And that's good news, right? That's good news that Jesus does not avoid us when we need him proves that he is God, in my opinion. Um, so there's a verse, Revelation 3.20, that says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens up the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. But Jesus never leaves us. But we often leave him. We're the ones who often try to avoid him, right? We're the ones that treat him poorly, that say one thing but do another, that go whole lot of time without ever praying or reading our Bibles. We use them for whatever we want. Then something goes wrong, we're praying to them. Like, please help me out. I pray. I, I swear that I'll pray more. I swear to read my Bible more. Just give me this one thing, right? We use and mistreat Jesus all the time. Yet he is always the one who is there for us, no matter what. He never avoids someone who needs him. This is really sweet. You don't work your way to Jesus. You don't work your way to Jesus. But he is always right there for you. Brings me to my second point for it tonight, and that is you cannot BS Jesus. Cannot BS Jesus. So John 4, 16 through 19 says this. Jesus said to her, talking to the woman at the well, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> have you guys ever tried to BS somebody and just went really south real quick? Yes. Yeah, yes. Right now. So I was trying to think of the best story to share with you guys. Also, that would be appropriate. But this is the best one I could think of. So when I was 18, when I was 18, I got my first tattoo. It covers my whole arm. So you really can't hide this tattoo. And a little thing about me, I grew up in a really conservative home. My grandparents, actually my mom was growing up, they didn't even play cards, like that's how strict they were things. They didn't go to the movies, very strict. And so growing up, it was always, you know, you had to hide the music when your grandparents came over. You definitely didn't get a tattoo, right? My grandma, actually when I was young, she told me, if you ever get a piercing, get it in your nose so I can just yank you around with it. <laughs> my grandma's a bad woman, I'll tell you what. So, I get this tattoo, I think I get it from her, you know, I hit her on Instagram and Facebook because all the grandmas are now on Facebook, I don't know why, that's why we're not on Facebook, right? Yeah. And so I hit it from her, told my cousins not to tell, told my mom not to tell, I think we're the good. But she came out in the middle of the summer in Arizona, which you guys know from this summer, it's like 110 degrees plus. And my idea to hide this tattoo from my grandma was just to wear long sleeves the whole summer. Like the whole time she was in town, I was just gonna wear long sleeves, she would never know. Well, I didn't know what she already knew. And so every day I'd go out to our guest house, I'd visit with her, you know, I'd be wearing long sleeves. And eventually she starts to go, Hudson, you know, it's pretty hot outside. Why are you wearing long sleeves? You look like you're sweating right now. And me being 18 years old, I was like, I got her on this one. Grandma, I'm wearing long sleeves because it actually shades your skin from the sun and it makes you cooler. So that was the excuse I gave her, right? And she just smiled at me looking back. She totally knew I was lying. I went on for a few more days, and finally she wanted to put me out in misery, and she just let me know, hey, your cousin's right on you right away. So I was not fooling her at all. She was not buying my BS. And much like my grandma not buying my BS, Jesus is not buying this lady's. See, let's call it for what it is. This lady most likely was a prostitute. That's why Jesus said, you've had many husbands. The man you're with right now is not your husband. 
He calls her out for it. But notice this. He gets right to the truth. He goes straight to the chase. He knows that in order for her, for him to bless her the way he intends to, they've got to be honest with each other. So he calls her out. He brings this up. But notice how patient he is with her. Very patient with her. She even tries to change the subject, right? I actually love the fact she says, I perceive you're a prophet. Like, yeah, no, duh. He just told you everything that you've done and you've just met this guy. But notice what she then tries to do. She then brings up the two things that you're never supposed to bring up at a family reunion. You know what they are? Politics and religion. Don't bring them up at family reunions. She brings them both up. And the question, the question she asks Jesus is about worshiping. She asks him a theological question. Hey, the Jews say you have to worship in Jerusalem. We Samaritans say you got to worship in Samaria, the, our temple. Which one are we supposed to worship in? So notice she tries to give Jesus the old runaround, right? Oh man, he just totally called me out on my sin. But I'm gonna try to be like really religious right now with him. How many of you guys have tried to? How many of you guys have tried to change the subject with Jesus, with God? So maybe this is how it goes, right? Man, you know, I really haven't been consistent in church. I really haven't been going to church, but. You know, the church isn't a building. It's a body of believers, so I don't really need to go there. I can my Bible at home. I know you guys aren't reading your Bible at home, so, you know, that's a lie to Jesus. But we do that, right? We try to reason with him. We try to make excuses. How about this? You know, I've been lazy with my time. I've been pretty selfish with my time. But if God didn't want me to stay at home one day, he wouldn't have created Netflix, Hulu, or video games, right? Like, come on. This is God's fault, not mine. All right, stay at home. How about this one? If I was supposed to love people, if God really called me to love people, you wouldn't make people so annoying. Can I get an amen for that one? Like, people are annoying yeah. sometimes. Okay, we're not, we're not. Amen. Yes. There we go. All right. Fortunately for us, though, just like this lady, even when we're doing those things with God, he still pursues us. He still loves us. He's so patient with this woman. But notice, he's very direct with her. So he answers her question. He says, you're not going to worship in Jerusalem. You're not going to worship in Samaria. In fact, I'm doing a brand new thing. You're going to be worshiping me in spirit and in truth. And he reveals to her who he is, and she believes. See, that's what Jesus needs to do with us sometimes. We're going to have those real conversations when he just cuts to the chase. We have to allow him to do that. He's always right there. Jesus wants to know you in the midst of your sin, right in the middle of it. Don't go try to fix yourself and then come to him. No, he wants to know you right now, right in the middle of it, right in the middle of your pain, right in the middle of your hurt, right in the middle of your excuses is right where Jesus wants to know you. He meets this lady right where she was at, in the middle of the day, at this well in Samaria. You can't be as Jesus, you don't need to try. Brings me to my last point for tonight, and that is that Jesus offers you living water. So John 4, 10, if you're still there, we're going to read 10 through 14, it says this. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Oh, you thirsty. Oh, you thirsty. There's a movie called Idiocracy. Maybe you guys have seen it. It was a movie back in the early 2000s. It wasn't super popular. And I haven't seen it in a while. I was trying to find it on Hulu or something. They were going to make me pay money, so I didn't watch it. But here's how I remember this story going. It's hilarious. I think about it all the time. So there was a guy who was in the army, and the army was doing an experiment. And they were going to freeze him for a year and then bring him back to life in a year, kind of like a time travel, you know, immorality type thing. I said the wrong word, that's correct, we move on. So they freeze him, but then this part of the military gets defunded. They forget about the guy. He stays frozen for 70 years or something like that. Over the span of these 70 years, the world progressively gets stupider because all the smart people in the world, they wait to have kids. They get careers, they go off and do things, and they stop having kids. Meanwhile, all the really dumb people in the world are having kids, and because they're dumb, their kids end up having uh, relations with their own siblings, and then people get like really dumb as time goes on. So that's literally the plot of the story. 
Here's where it gets good, though. They wake this guy back up 70 years in the future, and now this very average guy, not very intelligent, just right in the middle, he's now the smartest person in the entire world. So they make him president, and they're trying to have him fix all their problems with him, all these problems in the world. Fun fact about these guys, they only drink Gatorade. They believe water is only used in toilets. Why do they drink Gatorade? Because Gatorade has electrolytes. It's not funny to you, let's go watch the movie, it'll be hilarious. But, here's the thing, all their crops are dying. In this movie, all their crops are dying. And the guy goes up to try to solve the problem of why their crops are dying, and he realizes that they also use Gatorade to water all their crops. And the crops are all dead, they can't figure it out, right? Here's the thing, I googled this and looked at a bunch of health websites to make sure I'm not making it up. If you were to only drink Gatorade, never drink water, you would actually die. See, it matters what you drink. There are things that you might be drinking that you think are going to quench your thirst. If it's the wrong thing, you might actually die. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Not in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense. So he's telling this woman, you keep coming and drinking all these things, right? She's thirsty. She keeps going to all these guys, all these relationships. And he's like, you're still thirsty. I'm going to give you something that's going to quench your thirst once and for all. And that is the living water that I have to offer so here's what I'm going to ask you tonight. Here's really where we're going to land. And I want you guys to be thinking about this. Where are you going in life right now to satisfy your thirst? Where are you going in life to satisfy the desires you have? Where are you going in life to fill that hole that's in each and every single one of us? What are you putting your hope and your trust in? Hoping that it'll bring some sort of because guys, I can tell you right now, unless that's Jesus, you're going to be thirsty over and over and over again. Maybe it's relationships. I would say most of us, most of you guys, when I hear you talking and interacting with one another, relationships are the biggest part of your life. Whether it's romantically, boyfriend, girlfriend, someone who you wish was a boyfriend or girlfriend, whether it's just your friend groups, people you hang out with. I would say most of us were honest. We put most of our value, most of our worth, we really depend on those relationships to satisfy our needs. And I'm sure you've all experienced at this point, but relationships all fail you. There's not a single person in your life that will not fail you besides God. So if you're putting your hope in relationships, you are going to find yourself needing to go drink again. Maybe you put it in the hope that, you know, honestly, high school kind of sucks right now. I'm not really about it, but someday when I go to college, when I get to college, life is going to figure itself out. It's going to be great. I'm going to go to GCU, lobes up, because that's the best college. I'm going to find my wife and my husband there. Things are going to be amazing. I'll tell you what, college, though it's great, it's not going to satisfy your desires. You might even get married. You might find that special person. I can tell you, if you go into marriage expecting to satisfy your deepest desires, you're going to be so, so sorry. Because nothing can satisfy your desires in this world but Jesus. Everything else will cause you to go back and drink more and more and more. Personally, for me right now in my life, it's financial security. Just got married, out in the real world now. And honestly, I put most of my hope, I put most of my longing to be satisfied in having money in my bank account. I'm going to be honest, I trust my bank account way more than I trust God in those days. What's sad, though, is I've done the math over and over again. There is not enough money I can make in this world to actually make me feel comfortable. Money comes and goes. Jobs come and go. Things come and go. You just never know. Everything in this life will fail you except for Jesus. Those desires you have, that longing for satisfaction, only gets fulfilled when you meet it with Jesus. Everything falls apart and will leave you thirsty except for Jesus. Life is hard. I understand that some of you are going through some things right now, and it's just a crappy situation. Like, you were dealt a really, really bad hand. But for most of us, the anxiety we feel, the depression we feel, the loneliness, this constant state of apathy that we're in, this laziness that's not wanting to get up and go do anything, the reason most of us feel that way is because we're going through things in this world to satisfy us that just keep letting us down over and over again. I don't think I have to convince you much. I know you guys have all felt this. This story is here because even this woman at the well who has had a life full of shame and regret, 
when she meets Jesus, she realizes that she doesn't need to keep going to those things anymore. That Jesus truly satisfies her every need. And Jesus is here tonight, standing right next to you, saying, knock on this door, I'll open it up, and I will satisfy your every desire. He loves you. He is waiting for you. He knows you, and he does not condemn you. He might speak some truth to you, but he does not condemn you. And he offers you what you actually need. So as we end tonight, I want to ask you, where are you going to drink? What are you going to drink? God is waiting to offer you living water because he's the only one who can satisfy your thirst. Let's pray.